You know, I've just got to tell you one more story before we finish. And it was that story I told you about the boys being stuck in the lift, do you remember? And because sometimes we can get so busy that we neglect that which is important. I remember these two boys, I was working on top of the lift in a high-rise building. And I was sitting down just, just musing, just waiting, and the roof was going up and down, you know, people were using it. And it went down to the ground floor, and two little boys came in, about seven years of age. Some of you remember that story, I'm sure. Two little boys came in, and they, um, they looked at each other, and they said, we're not afraid of this, are we? And I said, nah, we're not afraid. So they pushed the top button. Up they went, shoo, we're right at the top. I said, I wonder what they'll do when they get there. And they pushed the, got the top, and they pushed the down button, right down to the bottom again, right down to the bottom. They're going up and down, having a marvelous time, cackling and laughing and enjoying this immensely. I said, oh, I'll fix them. <laughs> So on their, on their journey down, because you can control it from up top there, you see, in a limited way, and on their journey down, because they travel quite fast, on their journey down, I suddenly threw the emergency stop button and switched the lights off, and it was suddenly darkness and just <coughs> to a halt. There was just silence, not a sound. And then after about what seemed like an eternity, I want my mommy! You know, that was <laughs> was this great scream. I felt so sorry for him that I flicked the switches back on and when it went down to the ground floor, you'd never seen two little boys run so fast in all their life. <laughs> they were gone. <laughs> Friends, sometimes in life, our lifts stop too and the lights go out. I think of Jackie, Jackie's mum, not the Jackie here. <laughs> Another Jackie. Her mum was a, a lecturer at the school in science, the university in science. She had cancer and she asked me to come and see her because her daughter was going with my nephew and she knew that I was a minister and she asked me to come and see her. When I went in to see her, she only had a few days to live. I remember she, she reached out her hand and she said, I need God and I don't know how to find him. For her, you see, her lights had gone out and lifted stopped and she needed that help. And friends, in all of our lives, we come to that experience sometimes and that's where yeah, this word of God. And those, those four absolutes, I believe, can take us through anything. The gospel, salvation in Jesus Christ alone. Then the Holy Spirit helps us to live for him. And base our faith upon the word of God and that alone. And the hope of Jesus soon coming. Those are my absolutes for the church. I long for a church that passes no moral judgments on anyone. No moral judgments on anyone. Friends, I've learned to be very careful in passing spiritual or judging the spirituality of other people. We should never do that. I long for a church where people are more important than the theological arguments that we sometimes argue. You remember in Matthew chapter 25, the sheep and the goats? Jesus never said to the sheep, come into my kingdom because you believed in the sanctuary doctrine. Come into my kingdom because you've got the 2,300 days all sorted out and you clearly understand the prophetic word of God. Come into my kingdom because you've got the book of Hebrews all sorted out. He never said that. He said, come into my kingdom because I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you cared for me. What a testament. That's the kind of church I want. I want a church that practices the gift of 1 Corinthians 13, agape love. Remember it says here, if you have all the prophecies and you can understand all the theology, if you don't have love, it's nothing. You remember what Philip Yancey said, and I loved those words, and they, they bored into my heart so deeply. And, and I, just, I just feel so annoyed when I heard him say that, because I thought, why didn't I think of that? You know, some people can put things so beautifully and just sum up what you're thinking, can't they? Where he said that we as the Christian church are to be the dispensers of God's grace. Don't you love that? Like the fragrance of a flower. Wow. Just imagine if we had to have a church like that, we are the dispensers of God's grace. Showing that love, toleration, and understanding. That's the big rocks. You know, I remember there was a professor. He was the one that initiated the, the Willow Creek Church. Remember um, Hybels, Bill Hybels, at Willow Creek Church? It was this professor who had initiated it, and they were having their uh, a big reunion and all the, all the members who had come to know Jesus through the Willow Creek Church were there, and there was about 20,000 people in this huge arena. And the official photographer went to take a, a picture of the, of the big crowd, and just as he, 
was taking his picture, a person in the, in the audience or the congregation flashed a little home camera and they were perfectly synchronised, the two cameras. And when he developed his film, he was shocked to see because there in this big film that he had taken was just a big blur. But right in the centre of the blur was the face of this old professor who had initiated the whole program. And tears of joy were just rolling down his face. And he just stood out amongst all the others. It was a freak shock. When I read that story, I thought, you know, that's a bit like it was. And I tried to symbolize the, the gathering of God's people. You know, and, and there with the, imagine the two, two photographs synchronized together. There in the midst of the throng will be the face of Jesus with, with tears rolling down his face. And he says, yeah, it was worth it all. It was worth it all. May God bless you. We look forward to fellowshipping with you this afternoon.